Well, hello again, everybody. Two more lectures, and the one today is on modernism in American literature. So let's go ahead and get started. Now, in order to, uh, modernism is the period that the Great Gatsby comes out of, and in order to understand it, I need to pit it against another very similar term called modernity. There's a difference between modernity and modernism. Modernity is a term largely used by historians to reference the period after the Renaissance and forward, the broad histor historical period and culture and mindset from about 1500 to the present. Uh, a colleague of mine and a friend by the name of Dr. Grant Broderick, who teaches down in Florida, um, has written and thought a lot about this, and he defines modernity this way, that period of time and distinctive way of life beginning in the Renaissance and extending to the present, characterized by, so these are the things that define it, the autonomous quest of human beings to understand and master the world in order to live more freely, comfortably, and enjoyably within it. This quest of human beings to be free from outside control, that's what autonomous means, to throw off any control over us and to uh, understand and master the world in order that we might live more freely, comfortably, and enjoyably within it. Those are some of the defining traits of this wide historical period called modernity. Now, more narrowly, in the early 20th century, there's an artistic movement called modernism. And what might be a little confusing, but if you think about it, it makes sense. Modernism, as an artistic and literary and philosophical movement, critiques a lot of the broad assumptions of modernity. Artists and philosophers often critique the kind of broad assumptions of their own historical period. And that's what we see in modernism as a uh, artistic movement. So what is distinctive about modernism? It is a movement that radically rejects tradition in favor of the new. Um, and in order to do this, it emphasizes experimentation in form. Find some new way to convey poetic experience. Find some new way to narrate a story. Find some new way to convey a visual image in painting uh, to your viewer, right? Experiment, play around. Don't do what other people have done. Come up with something new. Um, second, Modernism saw and portrayed the world as fragmented, fragmented culturally, artistically, and narratively. Well, what does that mean, fragmented? One of the defining traits of modernism is that it feels this loss of the old unities and old certainties. That is, um, modernism imagines, I think rightly, but perhaps there's room for criticism here, imagines that in past periods, the world as a whole made sense to the people who lived within it. Think about the Christian worldview for a minute and the way it provides an overarching narrative that makes sense of every aspect of our lives. It all seems to fit together. Even when we have difficult, troubling uh, things in our lives, they fit together as part of this larger picture that we can make sense of. Well, modernism loses its faith in that kind of unity and thinks that uh, really uh, the best way to convey human experience in the world is to portray us as fragmented, right? As, um, as, as creatures of conflicting urges and desires, right? And to portray us as fragmented both in the stories that we tell and the way we tell those stories and in the visual representation of the world that visual artists produce, right? Well, that sense of the fragmentation of the old unities, the old certainties, goes hand in hand with another defining trait of modernism as an artistic movement. And it is that sense that the West has lost faith in God, man, and progress. Now, some of the um, modernist poets and, and, and writers and such um, mourn deeply that sense of lost faith, right? They mourned that um, the certainties that they, that they felt used to exist and no longer did. And some, as in the case of T.S. Eliot, the great um, American and British poet, and, uh, and C.S. Lewis, 
right, and a number of others, um, return to faith late in their life and find in it comfort for the wounds that modernism reveals. I should also, before I go on, make a little footnote here uh, to say that when the modernists critique what we call the myth of progress, the myth of progress is this notion that as time goes on, our technology will make life better and better and better for us. And in fact, that technology making life better and better and better for us will mean that we will become better people. We'll no longer have to go to war with each other even. Uh, we'll no longer steal from each other because technology will provide for our wants and our needs. It will, in an almost religious way, save us from sin, right? If you have a, a process and farming technology and food production technology that produces enough food that everybody can have it, well, then why would people have to steal food from one another, goes the thinking, right? Um, if you develop educational systems and governmental systems that, um, that are so good at establishing peace and allowing conflicting parties to work with each other, there will be no more war. This is a powerful myth of progress inside modernity, that broad historical period. And it still is powerfully with us today. A lot of people just automatically assume that everything newer must therefore be better and, and kind of buy into this old, well, Star Trek if view of, uh, of the world of, of government and politics, right? If you've seen Star Trek, uh, you know that um, Earth has finally achieved peace with uh, a stable government, uh, the Federation, and, and there's no longer war, violence, or need on the planet Earth, so they go out exploring other stars, right? Now, there's the myth of progress powerfully portrayed in pop culture, right? And modernism is not... It, it questions that myth pretty powerfully. And another way that uh, has been getting a lot of attention in the last 10 or 20 years by um, non-European Christian writers uh, to question that myth of progress, another way to question that myth of progress is to say it is not in fact true that Christianity is on the retreat, that faith, not just Christianity, but faith more broadly, is on the decline. If you look around the world, the Christian, well, the Christian faith in particular is exploding in the global south, in Africa and in South America in particular. And this flies in the face of that old myth of progress that said, well, listen, as our technology gets better and better and more and more people get access to Western technologies, they're going to give up their old superstitious beliefs and belief in God, belief in, in any sort of deity, including uh, the Christian God will fade away, and eventually people will become more and more secular. Now, that certainly does seem to be the trajectory of Europe and of America, although you know there are ways you could debate that, but it's certainly not the trajectory of the global south or the world taken as a whole. So there are, there are important ways that we have to question this automatically assumed myth of progress. The modernist artists and philosophers, they do it in some ways, and then more recently, the postmodernists and, uh, and, and, and Christian writers in the last 10 or 20 years or so have been questioning it too in important ways. All right, well, let me show you some of this stuff. Um, so one thing that modernism does is it rejects tradition in favor of the new. One of the founders of this school of thought was the American poet Ezra Pound, and he once wrote, the artist is always beginning. Any work of art which is not a beginning, an invention, a discovery, is of little worth. The very name troubadour means a finder, one who discovers. And when he was asked to give the creed of modern art, he says it is this, make it new. Make it new. Come up with some new way. Discover some new way to tell your story or convey the experience in your poem. So let me give you two examples. On the left is a uh, poet, a poem by the modernist poet E. E. Cummings. This was written in 1958. L A. Now, if you just try to read this poem, it looks like it doesn't make any sense. La le a fa. You have to step back for a minute. Cummings is, well, he's experimenting with his form. How can he convey an image and an experience to you using some way that's not been tried before? 
And if you look at that poem for a little bit, you see that if you trace down inside the parentheses, there's a phrase, a leaf falls. And it's moving down the page. And the stanza breaks give it a kind of broken movement, like a falling leaf might have, right? And now that's inside of these parentheses, and that phrase is stuck inside another word, loneliness. So what's Cummings doing? He's experimenting with poetic form to see if he can convey to the reader the, a, a particular striking visual image, a single leaf falling, and an emotion that goes along with that image, loneliness. Um, in the interest of time, I won't read this out, but these are the ending lines of the great modernist novel Ulysses by James Joyce, written in 1922, so just three years before Gatsby. And we've talked about it before because it's a very famous example of the narrative style called stream of consciousness, where Joyce is trying to reproduce the kind of um, associative bouncing around leaps that our brains go through internally, right? Uh, that stream of consciousness style is an experimentation in form. Can I come up with a new way to tell a story? Can I reproduce the kind of, um, I won't, don't want to say chaotic, but um, associative, bouncing around internal monologue that, uh, that we sometimes experience when we just let our minds wander, right? All right, we see this experimentation in form in the visual arts too. Here's Marcel Duchamp's nude descending a staircase. That's an unusual way to portray that, isn't it? Well, why would he do something like that? Why would Picasso, did he just not know how to paint a, a woman with a, a girl with a mandolin? No, he did. We know from, we have Picasso's early paintings when he was uh, still a, uh, an apprentice of his craft. We know that he knew how to, to, to paint perfectly lifelike people. Well, what, he, what is he doing? He is both experimenting with form and trying out this great modernist creed of, or style, I suppose I should say, of fragmentation. Maybe, and uh, there are a couple things that go into this, and, and one is this. In an age of mechanical reproduction, in an age when uh, cameras and printing technology can rapidly and effortlessly and uh, perfectly reproduce the world, right? So you can have lots of text available to, to people, and you can have, uh, in, in a very short amount of time, perfect images of, say, a girl with a mandolin. Well, then what is left for the artist to do, for the visual artist to do, right? Uh, if Picasso were to paint a perfectly lifelike girl with a mandolin, he has just spent hours and hours of time on something that will look to any viewer like, oh, that's as good as a photograph. That's not the reaction that any artist wants. That's as good as a photograph, right? So because of the possibility of that mechanical reproduction, Picasso has to push the envelope a little bit. He has to, he has to ask, well, what can art do now in this age? How can art get you to look at the world with fresh eyes, with, uh, with, to, to see it in a way you might otherwise not see it? And how can art convey some kind of deeper message? and portraying the world around us, the external world, as copying the same kind of fragmentation, breaking apart, uh, that many of these modern artists felt inside, right? That they're now disconnected from their history, they're disconnected from their faith, they're disconnected from the old certainties that they had. Well, can they reproduce that in the external world too? Can they get you to feel that and to see the world that way as well? Now, sometimes artists had other messages involved. These are two very famous examples of modern art. And if you're the kind of person who says, I hate modern art because I don't get it, you probably have thought about paintings and sculptures like this before. Um, I'll focus on the one on my right here, Marcel Duchamp's Fountain. Duchamp just pulled an old urinal and submitted it to a museum. And maybe you're walking past this uh, museum in Paris. I don't know if it was the Louvre. I don't know where it was. And you see this, and it says on the little nameplate, Marcel Duchamp Fountain. And you think, what on earth? Why is that art? 
Now, I would submit to you that in that moment, that moment was the art. Modern art has a, offers a new definition of, of art. It's no longer the thing made, the painting itself or the sculpture itself. It's now that moment that exists between the viewer and the object. That's the artistic moment, right? So in exactly in that moment where you stand there and you ask, why is that art? That moment is the art. You're asking the question that Marcel Duchamp hopes that you will ask, right? It's, it's, it's a new theory of what art is and what it should do. Um, now, this, this fragmentation, I wanted to show you an example in a, a more um, traditional poetic form. This is one of my favorite poems, The Second Coming by W.B. Yeats. Oh, excuse me. Uh, I'll read it, The Second Coming. As I do, what I want you to listen for is Yeats's sense that the old certainties of the world are fragmenting, the old faith of the world is lost and replaced by something much, much worse. He kind of misses what we had before, right? Very modernist mood right there. All right, the second coming. Turning and turning in a widening gyre. That's a, a vortex spiral shape. Turning and turning in a widening gyre. The falcon cannot hear the falconer. Things fall apart. The center cannot hold. Mere anarchy is loosed upon the world. The blood-dimmed tide is loosed. And everywhere, the ceremony of innocence is drowned. The best lack all conviction, while the worst are full of passionate intensity. Surely some revelation is at hand. Surely the second coming is at hand. The second coming. Hardly are those words out when a vast image out of the spiritus mundi, the spirit of the world, troubles my sight. A, a waste desert sand, a shape with lion body and the head of a man, a gaze blank and pitiless as the sun, is moving its slow thighs, while all about it wind shadows of the indignant desert birds. The darkness drops again, but now I know that twenty centuries of stony sleep were vexed to nightmare by a rocking cradle. And what rough beast, its hour come at last, slouches towards Bethlehem to be born. So there's a lot going on. I wish we could spend more time with this poem than we have, but I'll point out just a couple things. And one is that line that I've highlighted at the beginning, things fall apart. The center cannot hold. Yeats gives us this image of a falconer, a man who hunts with a falcon, and the bird has kind of spiraled up and away from him and outside of his range. So the falcon cannot hear him anymore, right? And Yeats sees this as an image for where the modern world has come in reference to those old certainties and old faiths. And what has that led us to? Things fall apart. The center cannot hold. But for Yeats, this is not, yeah, yay, something new is coming, something's on the way. Even though he uses this, the, this religious language that would be familiar to his reader, as it is familiar to you, I'm sure, the language of the second coming. And as soon as he says some revelation is at hand, the second coming is at hand, he, he knows that you're going to think, oh, revelation, second coming of Jesus. But it's quite clear, as he continues, that he's not imagining a second coming of Jesus. He's imagining a coming of some other kind of beast that represents this new age, and it doesn't sound like a pleasant sort of creature, right? Um, it's sphinx-like. It has a blank and pitiless gaze. It moves in this slow, menacing way, and it's circled by indignant desert birds. He doesn't say vultures, but that's the image I get in my mind's eye. So we see a lot of those modernist themes in Yeats' Second Coming, including a lot, uh, his, his recognition that um, the modern West has uh, lost faith in God, man, and progress. When we talked about the old realist period, we talked about the great confidence that people put in technology to deliver them from the limitations um, on human experience, right? 
just as technology is delivering us to a more comfortable life from the 20th century, perhaps it can deliver us to more comfortable philosophies as well, right? Perhaps it can deliver us from our old um, desires towards, uh, towards um, violence and, and, and greed and those sorts of things. A lot of modern poets come back from the First World War with the sense that that technological progress, which was to save us, to elevate us, to bring us to that Star Trek Federation or something like it, that technological progress had betrayed us because we had not actually used it to make the world a better and better place. We had used it to find more uh, cruelly efficient ways to kill each other very quickly in large numbers. World War I was an intensely violent and, uh, and horrific conflict. The style of warfare in it was um, new in a lot of ways, and new in ways that it depended upon technology, right? So for example, um, the, the warfare was fought uh, trench warfare style, where uh, men would move forward, dig a trench, and hunker down and stay there for some time. And so as uh, a, a way to kill men who were not uh, presented as targets to be shot, poison gas was developed. And poison gas was an especially horrible way to die. It, uh, it just kind of burned the lining inside your lungs, and you would drown on your own fluids. And uh, it, was a, it was a painful and horrible way to go, and it was an awful way to watch someone else die. In fact, we have a poem um, by uh, Wilfred Owen, who is a British poet who um, fought in World War I, and it's called Dulce et Decorum Est. Now, in the interest of time, yeah, okay, let's, let's, let's listen to it. It's worth listening to. It's only two minutes long. Bent double, like old beggars under sacks. Not need, coughing like hags, we curse through sludge. Till on the haunting flares we turned our backs and towards our distant rest began to trudge. Men marched to sleep. Many had lost their boots but limped on, bloodshod. All went lame, all blind, drunk with fatigue. Deaf even to the hoots of disappointed shells that dropped behind. Gas, gas, quick boys. An ecstasy of fumbling, fitting the clumsy helmets just in time. But someone still was yelling out and stumbling and floundering like a man in fire or lime. Dim through the misty panes and thick green light as under a green sea I saw him drowning. In all my dreams before my helpless sight, he plunges at me, guttering, choking, drowning. If in some smothering dreams, you too could pace behind the wagon that we flung him in and watch the white eyes writhing in his face, his hanging face like a devil sick of sin. If you could hear at every jolt the blood come gargling from the froth corrupted lungs, obscene as cancer, bitter as the cud of vile, incurable sores on innocent tongues, my friend, you would not tell with such high zest to children, ardent for some desperate glory, the old lie, dulce et decorum est, pro patria mori. Here it is. So Wilfred Owen is describing a gas attack, and he ends with these uh, stark and memorable lines. If in some smothering dreams you too could see all this that I have seen. My friend, you would not tell with such high zest to children ardent for some desperate glory, to the young people still back in England or in America just uh, wanting to join the military to go and earn for themselves the, the glory that they think they will they will achieve there. You would not tell children ardent for some desperate glory the old lie dulce et decorum est pro patria mori, which is 
Latin for it is sweet and fitting for a man to die for his country. So Wilfred Owen rejects not just the technological progress that is offered by modernity. He and a great many other modernist artists, philosophers, and painters say, hold up just a minute, guys. This progress that you've put so much stock in, it is not all that it's cracked up to be, right? We are not the sort of people that, uh, that Whitman, that Emerson thought we would be, right? We have not lived up to the democratic idealism that saw things just getting better and better as more and more people came forward and participated, right? Um, and in their rejection of that myth of technological progress, many of these poets also reject those what seem to them old ideas, such as that classic Roman sentiment that it is good and fitting for a man to die for his country. They felt betrayed by those ideas. They felt as though those had been used as mere propaganda to bring them out as bodies to hold a gun and fight and die for causes that ultimately did not matter and to die in violent and horrific ways. You see this too in the stories of Ernest Hemingway. Uh, Hemingway um, saw combat himself uh, as an ambulance driver and was wounded in combat. And uh, this comes from his novel, A Farewell to Arms, in 1929, so four years after Gatsby. There were many words that you could not stand to hear, and finally only the names of places had dignity. Certain numbers were the same way and certain dates, and these with the names of the places were all you could say and have them mean anything. Abstract words such as glory, honor, courage, or hallow were obscene beside the concrete names of villages, the numbers of roads, the names of rivers, the numbers of regiments and the dates. Notice the way that Hemingway's narrator in this story says abstract words such as glory, honor, courage, or hallow, that is to make holy, um, were obscene. And as the Gettysburg Address, uh, Lincoln says uh, that, that sacrifice has hallowed this ground, right? Hemingway says those words are obscene and all that's left to us that means anything are the concrete names of places where people have fought and died, right? That is a caustic um, washing away, a loss of faith in God and in man, in progress, and in those old certainties. Now, um, you see this also in The Great Gatsby, and I don't want to leave us there. That's a bleak place to end. I don't want to leave us there, but I'll come back to it. You see it also in The Great Gatsby. And uh, Fitzgerald, as I told you in my lecture on him, he was Catholic. And uh, in his own life, his, his, his practice of Catholicism was certainly uh, um, evidently not very good, right? Um, but in his novels, you can see... <coughs> In his novels, you can see this same um, modernist awareness of what has been lost with a modern world that has perhaps, that maybe God has abandoned, or maybe has turned its back on God, or maybe both. And you see that in the novel with that great symbol that we will have to talk about, because I know we haven't already, the, the giant eyes of Dr. T.J. Eckelberg up in the sky. Now, um, I told you that I didn't want to leave you there in that, in that uh, pretty bleak place. And so I, I do want to, to, to point out to you that many of uh, many great writers of the period find their way back to um, a faith that heals the brokenness that modernity is, is pointing to. Um, poets like T.S. Eliot and uh, writers and storytellers like C.S. Lewis. Um, the great Southern uh, Catholic writer Flannery O'Connor. They, they are people who are aware of 
the brokenness in the modern West and are looking to the Christian faith in particular as something that, that actually provides the meaning that modernist thought has lost, right? So the great French uh, existentialist philosopher Jean-Paul Sartre at one point said, the only philosophical question left to us is whether we ought to commit suicide. He's faced with such a fully bought into this modernist um, loss of faith. He's faced with such an utter bleakness that he thinks maybe that's the only question still worth considering, whether we ought to commit suicide. And human beings are not meant to live on the brink of that kind of abyss. I would say also, it does not square with our experience of the world. And that's something that we see beautifully in Herman Melville's Moby Dick. You know, For all of his religious speculation, Melville is very deeply aware and shows us in several places that there is a, a rich spiritual side to man and a philosophy that ignores that is missing something that's genuinely there. So our course is cut short and takes us only up to this rather bleak period in, in terms of an artistic movement. But uh, I encourage you, as, as you do some reading of your own, to look especially at, say, uh, the writings of C.S. Lewis as a, a man who was raised in this mindset and uh, returned to the Christian faith as, um, as healing for the loss that he saw in it. Okay, well, I really look forward to talking more about Gatsby with you tomorrow. Take care, everybody.